<laughs> My name is Sheldon Helms, still, and I'm still the Vice President of Area Skeptics. I am honored to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Marty Klein. Dr. Klein has been a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified sex therapist for over 35 years. He is the author of seven books on the subjects of sex and sexual intelligence. His latest being His Porn, Her Pain, Confronting America's Porn Panic with Honest Talk About Sex, about which Dan Savage said, Marty Klein's work makes me feel sane. <laughs> Dr. Klein is also the author of over 100 articles in publications as diverse as Playboy and the Journal of Homosexuality. He has been a featured guest on numerous programs, including National Public Radio, The Dan Savage Podcast, 2020, Nightline, and even The Daily Show. He is a tireless speaker, having given over 1,000 keynote addresses for colleges and organizations around the world. Dr. Klein is a board member of the Society for Scientific Study of Sexuality and has been honored by the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. His book, America's War on Sex, was chosen as Book of the Year by the American Association of Sex Educators. Dr. Klein's talk this afternoon is entitled, Pornography 2017, Porn Panic, Public Health, and Porn Literacy. Please help me welcome to the stage, Dr. Marty Klein. How's that? Much better. Thank you so much for coming out today and skipping church. I really, <laughs> really I imagine churches around the Bay Area are just empty right now. <laughs> if you've got any crackly stuff, you might as well, you know, take it all out now, spread it all out on your lap. Uh, if you uh, if you have a, a mobile phone or a vibrator or something, you might want to turn it down. You don't have to turn it off, just, just turn it down. And for a copy of the slides that you're about to see, just go to my website, here's the URL, and you can get the slides this very second, or you can wait until you get home. And um, great, now we can start, thank you. We already passed the part about turning down your phone and all that stuff. Uh, so this talk starts on Labor Day in 1999. This talk starts in Labor Day in 1999. We might have been sitting around, me and Sheldon and some of you folks, we might have been sitting around, me and Leonard Tremio, hi Leonard. We might have been sitting around and we might have been uh, thinking, Leonard might have said to me, because you know Leonard thinks about things, Leonard might have said to me, what do you suppose would happen if the country were flooded with 24-7 porn? <laughs> Now, in 1999, this hadn't happened. Leonard's a very forward-thinking kind of guy. <laughs> so we would have been sitting around. And since it's my house, it would have been a nice Chardonnay. None of that red wine stuff for me. So Labor Day 1999, we're sitting around. What do you suppose would happen if the country were flooded with free 24-7 porn? And then it happened. And then I wrote this book. Just a few months ago, it was published, His Porn, Her Pain. And uh, I've been a sex therapist for 35 years, among other things. I'm a sociologist and policy analyst. And what I noticed since the country was flooded with porn, lots of people coming in and they're in conflict about pornography. But what I noticed is that when it's a couple, if it's two men, they're not quarreling a whole lot about porn. And if that couple has two women, they're not quarreling a whole lot about porn. And if it's a heterosexual couple, very few men complaining about women looking at porn. <laughs> so I see all this conflict in the office about pornography, and if it's in a couple, it's almost exclusively women complaining about men and men's use of pornography. Hence the title of the book, His Porn, Her Pain. Nice and ambiguous, so people... Uh, can project whatever they want to on this book and buy it. <laughs> then to their chagrin, find out what's inside. But it's too late. So what do you suppose?
suppose would happen if the country were flooded with free 24-7 porn? On New Year's Eve of the year 2000, we might have been wondering about that, but in the year 2000, that's when broadband came to the United States on a wide scale, and that's when we found out what would happen, what would happen if the country were flooded with free porn. And that was a natural experiment. You know, we had before broadband, after broadband. You had before broadband internet, after broadband internet with porn. And if we were paying attention as a culture, as a society, if we were paying attention to what happened, we could learn so much. But no, America does not want to learn what actually happened. So I'm here to tell you what actually happened. What actually happened. What happened is that the country collapsed into just another moral panic about sex. I call it the porn panic. One word. Porn panic. Now, this country has uh, a long history of moral panics. And you know what a moral panic is. That's a symbolic crusade. It's an artificial threat that's blown out of proportion by whomever uh, has, the, has the microphone, as it were. Um, generally, moral panics come up uh, when there's a perceived threat to the social order, whether that's real or not, whether it's about technology or not. And um, then there are people who we call moral entrepreneurs, and they get everybody all upset. And before you know it, the thing is self-sustaining. And, and What's most important about moral panics for us, I think, is that in a climate of moral panic, facts have very little interest to people. Because people are frightened and people are angry. And when people are frightened and angry, they have a lot of trouble digesting facts, unfortunately. And the United States has a long history, not just of moral panics, but moral panics about sex. And they go all the way back to the Salem witch trials, of course, but if you've been around, and I see some of you have gray hair, you might even be as old as I am. I might be the oldest guy in the room, I don't know. I'm even older than you, Leonard. If you're old enough, you remember a lot of these things. You remember just a few years ago down in Southern California, there was that satanic abuse uh, fear. There are still people in jail today from that satanic abuse thing that everybody was so terrified about. You may remember when rock and roll records were burned in the late 50s because they were so dangerous. Now, even I don't remember the moral panic around comic books, but there were congressional inquiries into comic books back in the 40s and 50s because people were convinced that comic books were leading to moral degeneracy, including around sexuality. You remember uh, the fear that people would smoke marijuana and uh, launch a sexual revolution. We know that didn't happen. Oh, wait. <laughs> you, may have remember, you may remember a few years ago the HPV vaccine. This amazing, wonderful scientific advance where we could inoculate an entire generation against HPV, which does, in fact, uh, lead to cervical cancer in some cases. But uh, the federal government, led by the religious right, was against this wonderful scientific achievement because they were afraid that it would lead uh, to young people having sex. I guess their vision is that there's a whole bunch of 13-year-olds uh, sitting around saying, gee, Kevin, I'd love to have sex, but I might get HPV, and becoming fertile 25 years from now, so we better not. I think their big fear was that people would say, you know, 13-year-old girls would say, hey, it's okay, Jason. I'm protected. Let's go. It's a complete misunderstanding of how 13-year-olds uh, make decisions. Like they're thinking so much about what's dangerous 25 years from now. Now, historically speaking, and this is true not just in America, uh, new technology, but, but it's, it's true in the West and in America in particular, but it's true throughout the West, uh, every new technology is adapted for sexual purposes. And in fact, if you develop a new technology and it can't be used for some sexual application, it has a lot more trouble uh, surviving as a new technology. Uh, so going all the way back to Gutenberg, um, 
the printing press immediately adapted for sexual purposes. <laughs> Going back to uh, the synth synthetic rubber, immediately adapted for condoms. And by the way, uh, America's first female physician, physician, Elizabeth Blackwell, she was against the distribution, the mass distribution of rubber condoms because she thought it would lead to prostitution. Interesting little fact. So we know that uh, photography immediately, uh, back in the 19th century, immediately uh, applied for sexual purposes. One of the very first movies in history, Thomas Edison's The Kiss, um, which was uh, about a 15 second shot of a, of a gentleman kind of uh, looking at this lady who was real close to him and then giving her a kiss on the cheek. And for that, um, Edison's entire uh, operation was almost burnt to the ground because people were so upset back in the 1890s that you would have cinema of a gentleman and a lady uh, kissing on the cheek. Um, credit cards, cars, and of course, smartphones. So the importance of this is that when a society is grappling, or when American society for sure is grappling with a disruptive technology, and by definition, disruptive technology, pretty complicated for a culture to deal with. While the culture is dealing with the disruptive technology, they're also dealing with new forms of sexual expression. Whatever that disruptive technology facilitates, whether it's cars, which enables people to get to the periphery of town and have privacy that they never had before, whether it's the electrification of downtowns, which was an amazing transformation in American culture right before World War I. It also had sexual implications. People were able to go downtown without being chaperoned for the first time at night. People were able to get together at night for the first time. So uh, disruptive technologies, the way that culture has to deal with them goes on two tracks. One is about the technology itself. One is about the sexual implications. And there's always uh, blowback, not just about the technology itself, but about the sexual application. And that's what we're looking at now with pornography, but we, we see that with a lot of things. Uh, so he says, hold on, I got to call tech support. <laughs> so when the, new, when the new internet came along in the year 2000, when broadband internet came along, America um, had to be dealing with this new, this newfangled technology um, and it also had to deal with the sexual application of this new technology, but America was not uh, a sexually healthy place. I don't know if you can remember that far back, the year 2000. This is where we need that woo -woo -woo -woo. Go, back. go back to the year 2000. American sexuality in 2000, this is how long ago this was, right? Sodomy was illegal, and by sodomy, that's not just uh, anal sex, that's also anything that's not intercourse. So oral sex, <coughs> legally, is sodomy. So anal sex and oral sex were criminalized, not just for gay people, by the way, but for everybody. Gays could not serve in the military. Uh, each state uh, in the United States was working very hard to see if they could censor the internet inside their state. I remember uh, testifying as an expert witness in a number of trials. Um, Arizona, for example, passed a law saying that you couldn't send any, any sexually oriented material into Arizona over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Makes Trump's wall look very small. I mean, they were, they were going to build a wall up to the sky. Up to the sky. So there was very, and, and the federal government was, uh, was leading the charge. There were congressional uh, committees trying to figure out how are we going to censor the internet so that uh, we can prevent people from getting too much access to sexual material. Abstinence only sex education was the norm. It was very difficult to find any sex education that was not abstinence only oriented. Um, adult bookstores, which still existed back then, and video stores, which still existed back then, they were being raided and people being thrown in jail, not just the owners of the stores, but the clerks. You know, a clerk would be sitting around reading a magazine and the feds would, or the county sheriff would come in or the state police would come in and uh, these people would be put in jail for years and years for obscenity, uh, which is a legally defined term, right? And strip clubs are being uh, closed down. That's when the sex offender registry thing really took off. Uh, 
in the late 90s and the early 2000s. So America was not, oh, and then there was that, how many people remember that? How many people remember that? You know, that was the most downloaded moment in internet history for a while. And I, I have a complaint about that, actually. Um, the lighting was so poor. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Uh, this is a quick timeline uh, about the religious right. 1973, Roe v. Wade might have been a Pyrrhic victory in the United States. Of course, it was uh, very important for the people involved uh, and all of the people who have benefited from that decision ever since, including uh, up through today. But 1973 was the launching of the anti-choice movement. That's when those people got really serious. And James Dobson and Jerry Falwell, they uh, led uh, meetings of the country's most important religious figures. That was the creation of the religious right as a political force. Um, the Moral Majority was founded. Uh, Jerry Falwell founded Liberty University, which today uh, there, there are people who have graduated from Liberty University Law School who are creating a lot of mischief. And um, the Southern Baptist Convention got purged of the moderates. And um, we started to have a bunch of born-again Christians not only running for office, but winning. In 1980, all three presidential candidates, Jimmy Carter, John Anderson, Ronald Reagan, all born-again Christians. And then, of course, in 2000, we had another born-again Christian elected as president. So uh, the religious right um, has really responded to its massive defeat in 1973 in Roe v. Wade. They've taken over most of the school boards in the United States. Very comprehensive agenda. And then broadband internet came to America. This is the context. This is the cultural context in which broadband uh, comes to American culture. And the religious right starts to see that restricting or regulating uh, sexual behavior is the way to get political power. I, um, I then wrote my 2006 book, America's War on Sex. That's the one that got all the awards, thank you very much. <laughs> Not from this group, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay, I still have high self-esteem, don't worry. <laughs> but talking about how bad sexuality can be, talking about how dangerous sexuality can be, became a legitimate, um, a legitimate avenue for acquiring political power. And that's what the religious right did. And everybody with a kid Everybody with sexual guilt or shame, everybody who has ever felt nervous about sexuality, either their own or somebody else's, is vulnerable to this message that sexuality is dangerous and that we need to uh, have a political power structure that will regulate other people's sexuality and keep us safe. And that's where we are today. And that's what happened with pornography. There was a transformation of the anti-porn critique. Most of you remember so-called Playboy magazine. You even remember Hustler, some of you. Maybe you had a friend who saw Hustler. <laughs> <laughs> when Playboy came along in the 1950s, uh, there was a reaction and people said it was immoral. People said, you know, masturbation is a sin. And it was the religious people who were leading the charge against pornography when Playboy represented pornography. And as more uh, magazines and then videos came online, it was still, pornography is immoral, it's dangerous for the person who uses it, it's bad for that person's morality, they're jacking off, jacking off is a sin, it says right there in the uh, uh, Bible, that's the word. Uh, <laughs> so so the, the anti-porn critique originally was about morality. It was about sin and morality and danger to the user. That critique, and so people who complained about pornography were a limited group. They had a lot of, they made a lot of noise, and they had a seat at the policy table. You know, Bishop Fulton Sheen has a seat at the policy table. The Catholic Church in New York City, very, very politically powerful, but still it was contained. But somewhere along the line, as we're seeing here, the critique went from, it's immoral, it's bad for the user, to, it's a public health menace, it's dangerous for everybody. And that's where we are today, and that's really a problem. Because 
because with this public health uh, danger model, that means that everybody who wants to talk about public health can open their mouth and talk about pornography, whether they know anything about it or not. So the people who are against trafficking, and I'm against trafficking, the people who are against trafficking, they now have a seat at the public policy table about pornography. All they have to do is say, pornography involves trafficked people, which it does not, and they get uh, to talk about it. The people who are against sexual abuse, I'm against that. People who are against domestic violence, I'm against that. People who are against child porn, I'm against that. We're all against these things. Now the good news is that, for the most part, these things have nothing to do with pornography. <laughs> However, because pornography is now being spoken of not as immoral, dangerous for the user, but a public health man is dangerous for everybody, dangerous not just for the user, dangerous for the user's marriage, dangerous for children, dangerous for women. I mean, this, this stuff is really toxic. It's really dangerous for everybody, according to this model. And now everybody who's concerned about public health gets to talk about it. The only people who do not have a voice around public policy, around pornography, are the pornography consumers. 60 million people. Imagine if the government tried to regulate, oh, uh, apples. And apple consumers were excluded from the conversation. Or for that matter, imagine if the, if the government tried to regulate apples and didn't talk to apple producers. It couldn't happen. In fact, the people who own the trucking companies who truck the apples down here from Washington, they would get a voice in the conversation about the government trying to regulate the distribution of apples. Pornography is the only consumer product where neither the consumers nor the producers get to have any voice in the discussion. And this has radically changed the conversation around pornography. Now the conversation is about a lot of things. The conversation is about violence. Pornography is not about violence, but the conversation about pornography is about violence. The conversation about pornography is about fear. Pornography is not about fear, but the conversation is about fear. So what actually happened, what actually happened when America is flooded with free 24-7 porn? Now I want you to be very impressed with this graph because I did it with my own little hands in the middle of the night, which is when all good things happen, right? <laughs> Except this talk. Um, so, uh, how nice to be with a group where I don't have to explain how to read a graph. <laughs> you know, the, the data takes two seconds to look at. Explaining what an x-axis is takes 20 minutes. So we don't have to do that here. Uh, time goes across the bottom, and this is schematic. Uh, so, the availability of porn between 2000 and the year 2016 shot up like a rocket. Everybody knows that, right? What happened? to the rate of sexual assault in the United States. It dropped like a stone. What happened to the rate of divorce in the United States? It went down. What happened to the rate of child sexual exploitation, or child molestation, if you prefer? It went down. Now, this is not my opinion. These are facts. These are facts from the Centers for Disease Control. These are facts from the FBI. And these are facts from the Crimes Against Children Research Center at the University of New Hampshire. Unless you think that there's something weird about America, this data is exactly replicated in a lot of other countries. Not countries like ours, like Canada, you know, which is like America like. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. Actual foreign countries. <laughs> like Japan, Hong Kong, Denmark, Croatia. This is what has happened in the United States. That these indicators of social pathology have gone down, these indicators of sexual pathology have gone down while the availability of online pornography has gone up. Now we are much too scientifically minded to say this proves that porn causes a decline in these things. <laughs> Although, you know, get me over lunch and we'll talk. But, <laughs> um, but what we can say is that, is that the concept that pornography leads to an explosion of child molestation demonstrably not true. That porn leads to uh, an explosion of sexual violence against women, demonstrably not true. Demonstrably not true. So, how much more time do I have, Sheldon? Uh, a quarter after three. Great, we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time, that's so good. 
I'm not hungry. <laughs> so what are some common myths about porn real quickly? Um, <coughs> Uh, this is what we hear. This is now in the air. This is the conversation. People like Gail Dines or Melissa Farley, they're saying things like, well, of course, uh, porn is all violent and therefore dot, dot, dot. Wait, 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 wait. Porn is not all violent. In fact, only a tiny, tiny sliver, a tiny, 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 tiny sliver of porn is violent. Of course, it all depends on how you code violence, right? You know, back when there was a big fuss about uh, too much violence on television, people were coding, uh, like morality and media, they were coding uh, TV shows. They were counting news programs um, where it shows, uh, uh, you know, somebody was shot in Chattanooga or whatever. They were coding that as violence. So if you code the news as violence, then of course that would change the data on how much violence there is in television. Well, it's the same thing with violence in porn. You know, it depends on how you code violence. Uh, there are lots of people, such as Gail Dines, uh, who say that a woman who's on her knees sucking a man's uh, penis, that's violence. So, I, I guess she's never had the experience. <laughs> and if she offered it to me, I would decline the privilege. So, maybe she would love to do it and just lacks opportunity, I don't know. So, comment is about porn, it's all violent. Excuse me, no it's not. And the reason it's not is incredibly simple. Most consumers don't want to look at violence while they're masturbating. It's real simple. If everybody in the country wanted to look at people shooting each other uh, or beating each other up, I'm sure that there'd be a lot more of that. But, you know, most people don't. Um, a very common myth about pornography is that people, couples are having these wonderful sexual relationships. They're, uh, you know, rich and textured and people enjoying each other and lots of variety. And in the middle of the night, porn sneaks in through an open window, <laughs> grabs the guy around the neck and yanks him away from that fantastic real life three times a week sexual relationship with some fabulous babe. And the guy starts masturbating to porn by himself and says, wow, this is so much better than making love with my wife. <laughs> I'm going to just do this. It's a crazy idea. It's a crazy idea. I'll tell you what does happen. People in long-term relationships, the sex typically becomes less frequent, less exciting, less emotionally nourishing. People kiss less. And at the very same time, a lot of people get involved with pornography. But it's absolutely nutty to think that anybody would leave a vibrant, real-life sexual relationship with a, with a partner so that they could be alone jacking off to pictures of naked ladies. It just doesn't make any sense. And I've never seen any data that, that suggests that it does. But people, people are talking a lot about it. And as I say in my book, His Porn or Pain, people would rather do anything than talk about, hey, Mabel, whatever happened to our sex life? Hey, George, whatever happened to our sex life? You never kiss me anymore. Whatever happened to that? Nobody wants to talk about that. People come into my office, they pay me a lot of money, and then they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and people would rather fight about pornography than talk about whatever happened to our sex life. The idea that actresses are trafficked or abused is um, demonstrably false. If you go down to the San Fernando Valley, down near LA, um, wherever there's a porn shoot, Young women are lined up around the block begging for the opportunity to be in porn films. They don't have to traffic anybody. Why would you traffic somebody and force them to do something when you have a huge number of people who are eager to do it for practically no money? So the idea that the industry has to traffic people is just silly. Um, we're hearing now that uh, young men are looking at porn and they're having erection problems. Nonsense. There's no data to suggest that young men have more erection problems now than they used to. It's just that people talk about it more, partly because there was all these commercials on TV, you know, people in a bathtub saying, gee, nice bathtub. Hey, nice erection too, excellent. Must be because of this product you just used, great. So there's no more ED than there used to be. Um, the idea that porn encourages violence against women, not true, not true, not true. Violence against women has not gone up in the last 17 years. In fact, it's gone down 
Um, and people say, well, violence against women is an underreported crime. Absolutely true. Certainly, it was underreported 30 years ago, and it's underreported now. If anything, it's less underreported now than it used to be. So the decline that we see in, in the rates of violence against women is actually understating the decline. And finally, the idea that you can get addicted to porn. No, you can't get addicted to porn. You can get addicted to alcohol, to Oxycontin, to heroin, to morphine. And if you've ever observed somebody going through withdrawal from genuine um, uh, addiction, it's hell on earth. People hallucinate, they throw up all the time, they can't sleep for days at a time, they shake, they can't eat, they're completely wigged out. If you take pornography away from a so-called porn addict, you know what happens? They get crabby. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably because when people get rid of the porn, they're also getting rid of the masturbation. That's usually part of the program. Well, if you take masturbation away from anybody in this room, they get cranky too. <laughs> so does that mean that I'm not concerned about anything having to do with pornography? No, that is not what that means. I'm glad you asked. No, there are lots of things to be concerned about when it comes to pornography. Not the things that some other people seem to be concerned about. The main thing we need to be concerned about with pornography is that kids are looking at porn and they don't know what they're looking at. They think they're looking at a documentary. Which is like looking at the NBA Finals and thinking that you're looking at playground basketball. Which you're not. So young people are looking at porn and they're thinking, oh, I guess that's what real sex is like. And there's an antidote to that. And it's not magically shutting down the internet for 100 years. <laughs> the, antidote, the antidote for kids looking at porn and thinking that they're learning about sex is to sit kids down and talk about sex. Now, if you really want to talk to kids about pornography and explain to them how porn is different from real sex, you would have to talk about real sex. And most parents don't want to do that, and most political actors don't have the will to talk about that. And so it's interesting, we hear all this stuff about all these complaints that porn is sex ed for kids. Well, who's responsible for the fact that there's no sex ed for kids? You know, there's a vacuum of education and information about sexuality. There's a vacuum. And, and kids, like any reasonable people, they turn to whatever they can to get whatever information they think they can. And, 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 and 12 year olds are not responsible, 12 year olds are not responsible for the lack of sex education that grown ups have imposed on them. And 12 year olds can't be expected without tools to look at porn and realize, oh, wait, 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 there's something going on here. That's not how it actually is. There's editing, right? There's things that go on off camera, like people using erection drugs, like people using animus, like people packing their orifices with lubrication, like people actually talking to each other. That's the main thing that goes on. Everybody should go to a porn shoot because, first of all, you know, watching movies being made is incredibly boring. It's, it's mostly about moving the lights. Right? And, and then when the action finally starts and somebody is saying, ooh, 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 then the sound guy says, wait, 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 there's an airplane passing overhead, we have to stop. Yeah. Just like, okay. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. So everybody should go to a porn shoot. And one of the things that you see in a porn shoot is that before the camera rolls, the actors and actresses, they actually talk to each other. They actually say things like, so, do you like your nipples pulled, or turned, or squeezed? Because, you know, the script calls for some kind of nipple action. That's a technical movie term, <laughs> nipple action. So, people in, in porn, they actually talk to each other before the camera rolls. Like, what do you like, and what do you not like, and what is your body capable? How far can I put your legs behind your ears before, you know, the whole thing breaks? So, <laughs> Now, if everyday people talk to each other about sex like that, I would not be, I'd be out of a job. You know, I'd have to spend all my time as a policy analyst and not do any clinical work at all. So, but young people don't understand that that's what's going on. And in fact, that's what's missing. Porn is a visual medium. So what's missing from porn 
is all the stuff that's boring to watch, but all the stuff that makes sex worth doing. Like the hugging, like the talking, like the laughing, like the going slowly, like the people saying, would you rather I do this, would you rather I do that? And what happens after the sex? You know, when people check their emails. So, <laughs> So what young people need to understand is that there's a whole lot of stuff that porn leaves out. And we don't blame porn for that because porn doesn't say this is sex education, pay careful attention. Porn says this is a visual medium, we're going to excite you, you know, according to your preferences, according to your fantasies. So in my new book, His Porn, Her Pain, I call it porn literacy. Young people need porn literacy. <coughs> And in fact, adults need porn literacy too. People need to understand that real sex doesn't feel like porn looks. Real sex doesn't feel as intense as porn looks. Real sex doesn't take place as smoothly and seamlessly. Because in real sex, sooner or later, right in the middle of things, somebody has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and you don't see that anymore. <laughs> in real sex, some, ow, you're leaning on my hair. Oh, wait, 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 wait. That's real sex. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not important. And there's no reason that it should be important. What else should we be concerned about? Um, we should be concerned that people are looking at porn, both men and women, and saying, why isn't my body like that? Because they think it's a documentary. You know, nobody looks at the NBA Finals and say, why doesn't my body look like the Brown James? But men and women are looking at porn and they're thinking, oh, that's what bodies look like. No, that's actually not what bodies look like. Porn, porn is very unusual bodies in very unusual circumstances doing very unusual things. I mean, in real life, when the pizza guy, delivery guy comes to the door. <laughs> but, but imagine, imagine the pizza delivery guy's union, they all say, hey, become a pizza delivery guy and guess how many blowjobs you're going to get. <laughs> how do we know? Look at porn. <laughs> and of course, porn, you know, porn promotes the fantasy that it's really easy to get a plumber to come to your house. <laughs> Not true at all. And one more thing that we really need to be concerned about is the enormous legal penalties for teen sex state. In half the states in the United States, the age of consent is lower than 18. So for example, in Nebraska, two teenagers who are 17 years old, it is legal for them to have sex. They don't need permission, they can't get in trouble just for consensual, of course just for consensual sex. Two 17-year-olds in Nebraska can, in fact, consent to sex. What they cannot do is they cannot take a photograph of what they're doing because the statute for child pornography uniformly in the United States is 18. And so you could be doing something legal and have a photograph of it that's illegal. And there are young people languishing in um, in facilities, in prison facilities right now across the country, being punished for taking uh, pictures, and particularly sending pictures over the internet of themselves, of themselves, doing legal things. And of course, in some places, you know, kids are having sex when they're 15 or 16. In a lot of states, that's not legal. Although, if they're of the same age and it's consensual, it's uh, kind of sort of legal if nobody complains, if nobody's parents get involved, and if no social workers get involved. It's mostly legal if the, if the kids are um, very similar in age. But taking a picture of that, set, taking a selfie, or you know, sending it on the internet to your ex-boyfriend or whatever it is, that's very, very illegal. And right now, Congress is considering a law to, to make the application of, of this uniform uh, with a mandatory felony prison sentence for any teenagers who send pictures of themselves um, in sexual, uh, sexual positions. And the thing about teenagers is that they really can't wrap their brain around the fact that they don't own their own bodies. You know, even the age of consent. I, 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 2020 did a show I was on a few years ago about the age of consent. They, they walked up to a bunch of kids in the mall and said, do you know what the age of consent is in this state? And they said, what's an age of consent? So 
you know, I, it's, it's ironic and cruel that adolescence is the time when young people are struggling to assert ownership over their own lives, which is what they're supposed to be doing. And then the law says, well, you, you may own your life, you may own your life and your body in certain ways, but not in other ways. And by the way, a picture of you in cer doing certain things can get you in trouble for the rest of your life. That's really dangerous. That's a really, really dangerous thing that we have foisted on uh, young people. So they need porn literacy, adults need porn literacy too, and that means information, that means communication skills, that means um, general media literacy. You know, I, I once spoke to a college class and I told them that I had recently spoken to the woman who decides what's on the cover of Newsweek. This is when Newsweek was still a magazine. And they all looked at me and they said, wait, 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 somebody actually decides that? I said, yeah, somebody actually decides what picture goes on the cover of a video game, too. You know, 17-year-olds are astounded by that. Like it's an actual human being who makes that decision. So, so young people, they need porn literacy, but they need general media literacy, too. They need to understand uh, that the media products that they consume are configured in a certain way. Even that sound that your phone makes when... Um, uh, you remember that, that tone that you used to get from dial-up modems? You know, somebody invented that. I'm probably one of you people in this audience. <laughs> in my book, I have, in my new book, I have a porn literacy questionnaire uh, that uh, people need to understand that um, people are paid to act in films, that uh, most people do not want you to come on their face, but, uh, you know, if you want to ask them, is it okay, you can ask them. How do you feel about me coming on your face? And then if somebody says, no, thank you, say, okay. I understand that. The most important thing to remember about porn is that real sex does not feel like porn looks. And we shouldn't be blaming porn for that. Porn doesn't aspire to anything other than what it is. The government is now in the process of renewing its war on sex when it comes to pornography. Um, the state of Utah was the first to have a legislative resolution declaring porn um, a public health hazard. Utah is now trying to pass a law that would enable consumers, actually the partners of consumers, to sue porn producers for, you know, a sort of a consumer uh, uh, damage, you know, like, uh, Porn ruined my marriage, therefore I get to sue the porn producers. Uh, so Utah's in the middle of doing that, but unfortunately, other states, and I talk about that in my new book, but unfortunately other states are copying the Utah resolution. And there's about 15, 16 states now that are in various processes, legislative processes, of passing laws, uh, resolutions, saying that um, porn is a public health uh, danger, and therefore, you know, money needs to be spent in that direction, and. Um, and, and law enforcement needs to uh, be trained by anti-porn advocates about how dangerous porn is, that it involves trafficking and stuff like that, even though it actually does not. So the new stakeholders in the war on porn, as I said before, all these people who, um, the stuff that they're trying to fight is for the most part okay. You know, nobody's in favor of predators online, although the good news is that there are very, 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 very few actual predators who actually get kids to do, uh, to leave their homes and, you know, go to Memphis and go to Graceland and all that. Um, but, but again, these are the new foot soldiers, people who are against uh, child porn. And of course, everybody's against child porn. Um, the, the adult porn producers, they're not in favor of child porn either. I mean, they're making so much money manufacturing a legal product. Nobody in their right mind wants to manufacture something that is not only illegal, but is looked down on so much that if you make child porn and you go to jail, the murderers will come after you because they look down on you in jail. You know, murderers say, look at that scum, that guy made child porn. Um, so, um, Visa and MasterCard are being pressured, are being pressured now to uh, not do business with porn sites, which is um, a really extra legal way. It's, it's, um, it's a really clever way of trying to shut down the porn industry. Uh, because the porn industry depends, of course, on credit cards. 
uh, requiring uh, port uh, filtering in public places. They tried this 25 years ago, if you remember with NetNanny and, and all those things. For example, uh, there are a lot of places where my website, which I assure you is not porn, um, like the, the state government in Arkansas, they have filtered at my website. And probably yours too if you have one. And, uh, and of course now there's uh, this whole thing about porn addiction and diversion programs. Uh, if you get caught uh, being drunk and urinating in public, uh, you uh, can cop a plea and go into a diversion program uh, um, to keep you from, uh, from looking at porn. So uh, he says, thank you for your email, I appreciate your concern, but I'm completely satisfied with the size of my penis. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to stick around uh, most of the day, I'll be happy to chat with anybody. Um, and of course my new books for sale, so for several of my other books for sale. And it's very easy to get a hold of me. I'm in Palo Alto, and uh, I reply to a significant uh, percentage of my emails. So uh, don't be afraid to contact me. And I really appreciate uh, you hanging around for my whole talk. Thank you. <laughs>